so today, let me introduce our speaker, Timur Sidov from St. Petersburg State University. So Timur has recently received a prestigious scholarship from Komisarov Foundation. So very few of them were awarded this year. And his talk will be devoted to Mobile Strip, Berry Face, and Fiber Bundles. So before starting, let me briefly remind you the rules of the seminar. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask. Uh, you may either raise your hand uh, by using the button in Zoom, or you may uh, ask the question by voice, but please make sure not to interrupt the speaker just in the middle of the sentence. So Timur, please, the stage is yours. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, let me introduce myself once more. Uh, my name is Timur. Uh, I'm a second year Magister's student at St. Petersburg State University. I study at the Department of uh, High Energy Physics and Elementary Particles. And uh, my field of research is mainly in the topics of uh, field theory and symmetries. Um, so uh, today I'm going to present you uh, a uh, talk uh, on the Mabel strip and berry face. Mostly we are going to concentrate, uh, however, on the topic of uh, differential geometry and fiber bundles. Uh, so this is the outline of our uh, talk, uh, our seminar. Firstly, uh, we're going to discuss briefly the numerical stimulation of a Mabel strip. Then we are going to move uh, to how to solve uh, the problem of Mobius strip analytically. Uh, then we're going to proceed to uh, vector fields in curved space. And then, well, we'll see. <laughs> so uh, we are considering the problem of the fields uh, on the dielectric Mobius strip uh, with different number of twists and finite thickness. Uh, in the picture on the right, you can see a five twist Mabel strip. Uh, and our task is to understand how to consider precisely the topological properties of a given system. Uh, well, of course, the first thing that uh, would be good to do is to carry out the numerical simulation so that all further constructions uh, would have something to compare with. Uh, of course, uh, we conducted such simulations. Uh, you will hear more about it from uh, Nikolai Solodovchenko uh, when he tells you his report. On the slide, you can see an example of uh, such calculation. <clears throat> uh, the scattering spectrum of uh, dielectric ring, uh, which is the same as the Mabel strip with the zero twists. Uh, the spectrum consists of sequential galleries, uh, namely this is the first gallery, this is the second, and so forth. Uh, uh, sorry. Is, yes? Can I ask a question? Uh, what is the direction of the incident wave? Uh, well, uh, it is <laughs> better to ask Nikolai, but as far as I remember, uh, the direction is in the plane of the ring. So if the ring is in x y plane, the direction of uh, the wave is also in, in x y plane. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah, but maybe another question related one, what is the polarization of the wave then? Because you have two possibilities for the... Uh, orientation of electric and magnetic field. Horizontal uh, polarization. So electric field in, in the plane of the ring. Okay. Yes. Yes. Good. Uh, so uh, as, as I told, this is the first gallery, this is the second, they go uh, so on and so forth. And this is simply a dipole peak. Uh, the spectrum, uh, 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 let's concentrate uh, on the first gallery though. Uh, this, is, this would be uh, our field of interest for the next few minutes. Uh, below on the slide, you can see uh, the cross sections uh, of different Mabel strips with a different number of twists. Uh, 
uh, that were offset relative to each other so that they could be compared on one graph. And uh, above, atop of the picture, uh, only resonance peaks are marked. Uh, it can be seen that with each additional twist, the entire gallery shifts to higher frequencies. Uh, from various calculations, with, which uh, Nikolai will tell you uh, about later, we can demonstrate that this effect is caused precisely by the appearance of an additional twist, and not, for example, by a change of the length of the Mabel strip. Uh, so that was about the numerical cal calculation. And uh, now that we have a rough idea of what to expect and where to look at, uh, we may wonder how to approach this problem. And that would be our task for the uh, rest of the seminar. I'm not going to present any results. I'm uh, rather going to uh, uh, explain how to approach this problem using not uh, the traditional berry phase approach, but rather a geometrical approach. Uh, so, well, once again, Timur, could you uh, so uh, uh, the frequency grows with the number of twists, right? Yes. Okay. All of the spectra shifts to higher frequencies. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, two approaches to uh, the Mebio strip problem that you can find in the literature are the traditional berry phase approach and the differential geometry approach. Uh, not the berry phase in the literature, not to the Mebio strip in the literature, yes. Um, is the berry phase approach and the metric approach. Uh, there is also a third one uh, which uses the effective Hamiltonian with spin orbital coupling, but uh, it is on one side, something in the middle of two approaches, and on the other side, it is, well, it falls off the scheme that I'm going to uh, present today. So we're not going to discuss it. Um, I believe that you are more familiar with the berry phase method that uh, I am, and you can find its application to the flat members uh, in the link on the slide. Uh, so, um, at the same time, I would like to introduce you more to the first method, uh, more in detail. And uh, towards the end, uh, I would like to show that this is actually the same thing. Uh, and along the way, I would like to acquaint you with an important mathematical apparatus uh, of the modern physics, uh, the bundle theory. So what is the bundle theory? Uh, this is one of the mathematical pillars uh, of modern physics from gauge theories and gravity to quantum mechanics, uh, virtually all branches of physics uh, in one way or another use fruits and benefits of bundle theory. Let's start with the definition. Uh, a bundle is a set of three elements. First one uh, is the total space, which we will denote as E. The second, is uh, the base manifold, which we will denote as M. And the third one is the subjective map called the projection, which uh, maps uh, the set of uh, points from total space into the base space. Uh, such set is called fiber. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, below you can see uh, schematical uh, depiction of uh, a fiber bundle. Uh, imagine that the whole space is divided into such uh, such curves. Uh, imagine that you are given a surface, uh, which is uh, depicted here as, as base manifold, uh, a surface that uh, uh, that each curve intersects only once. Imagine that you have identified uh, the entire curve with a point at which it intersects the surface. A set of three things, all space, uh, a set, uh, a surface, um, the and the identifi identification that you have specified is called a bundle. Um, 
The most important, however, for physics uh, type of bundle is called fiber bundle. Uh, the definition is uh, rather complicated. So after, right after the definition, I would like to give an example and explain it once more. Uh, A fiber bundle is a bundle for which the image of a small neighborhood uh, in the base in fibers can be deformed into a direct product of the neighborhood by some manifold. So uh, the mobile strip itself can also be considered as a bundle. The base of this bundle as a circle which can be seen from this image. This is the metal strip and this is the circle. So you map uh, each line from the metal strip into the circle. So you take a small neighborhood of the circle, uh, a small piece of a circle, if you may, and you look at the image of uh, this piece in the fibers. And you can see that you can deform, continuously deform uh, this uh, piece in fibers into a direct product of a piece of a base manifold um, by some uh, uh, linear line segment. Next, uh, we need the concept of a tangent space. It's uh, pretty intuitive. Uh, on one hand, but it's nevertheless crucial. Uh, take the manifold M, uh, like on this picture. Uh, take a point uh, in this manifold, uh, which we denoted as X, and draw every possible smooth line through coming through this uh, point. Then take the tangent vectors to these uh, curves. What you get is the set of vectors uh, that uh, may result in a linear space. Such linear space is called the tangent space. Uh, an example of the tangent space is the, for example, if a base manifold is a sphere, uh, the tangent space would be a plane attached to the sphere in one point. <clears throat> so uh, using this uh, definition, we may also define the tangent bundle. Uh, a definition is simple. Uh, a tangent bundle is a fiber bundle uh, where you have built a fiber as a tangent space over each uh, point of the of your mani base manifold. Uh, for example, uh, here you can see a sphere uh, where you have built uh, such planes as we discussed earlier uh, in every point of the sphere. A section of a bundle is basically a choice of one element in every uh, in every fiber. So in our case, if we are going to talk about this sphere, uh, it is a choice of one vector in each uh, tangent plane. Um, and it turns out that uh, all of the vector fields that we use in physics are properly mathematically defined as sections of a tangent bundle. Uh, why is it important? Well, uh, because it tells you that in each point, uh, a vector fields lives in its own space. And you cannot simply say, uh, um, give uh, arbitrary uh, vector field in, uh, for example, some curved manifold. You have to, uh, take into account that uh, in each point, uh, vector fields live in its own space. Uh, for example, let's say that you want to differentiate uh, a vector field. 
by the coordinates in the base manifold. By definition, a derivative is the di difference between values of a function at infinitely close points. But uh, we have values of a function, a vector function, uh, that live in different spaces. How can we subtract them? <clears throat> to do this, we need a mapping that takes them to the same space. Uh, this mapping is called transition mapping. Uh, in the literature, you may find it uh, called the connection, but uh, to avoid the confusion with the uh, connection that we will define below, uh, we will call it the transition map. Uh, so, since uh, both of our uh, tangent uh, spaces that our vector fields belong to in different points are linear spaces, we can write a transition map as a um, linear, tr uh, linear transform. Uh, also, if it is obvious that if we are moving, not moving anywhere, then the map is identical and equal to Kronecker delta. And since we want mapping to be uh, smooth and continuous, uh, that is expandable in Taylor uh, series uh, in terms of shift. Uh, we can represent the uh, infinitely close transition like, like this. Uh, so, uh, the coefficient uh, at the first degree of the shift, uh, in fact, is a generator of a shift, and it is called the affine connection. Uh, using the found affine connection, we may now compute the derivative. Uh, such Sorry, derivative. To, to, to yes, yes. Equ equation. So, uh, c is actually a vector. Right? Yes. Yes. So at the previous at the previous uh, slide, uh, you, so the equation number two. So do we assume that uh, I could imagine I could imagine that I have a points where where a g uh, is zero up to the first order in c, but it starts from the c square, for example. Or is it not possible by some? By some, uh... Uh, we are assuming that uh, C is infinitely small. Uh, we are computing the derivatives. So ah, okay, uh, okay. So C is infinitely small. Yeah. So it yes. cannot have the second power here. We just omit the second power. Yeah, I see. Okay. Yes. yes. Uh, so uh, now we may compute uh, the derivative, uh, and uh, such derivative is called uh, covariant derivative, uh, which is written right here. Uh, so, if a manifold <clears throat> is equipped uh, with a metric, and this metric is uh, considered to be covariant constant, uh, which means that uh, the action of our covariant derivative on the metric uh, tends to zero or is a zero, uh, and the connection is symmetric, which is which can also be done like practically anywhere. Uh, if you don't have a spinors in your theory, uh, you may express the connection as in, for, uh, in formula. I cannot see a number right here because of the zoom, but uh, I believe it should be. It is four, five, four. so four, four probably. Yeah, Timur, may I ask a question regarding this slide? Yes. So, uh, as far as I know, in general relativity, they do assume this Riemannian geometry and this type of expression for Christoffel symbols. But yes. generally, you have much more, uh, you know, flexibility. For instance, uh, why do you assume which physical assumptions underlie this uh, covariant derivative of metric tensor is equal to zero? Because when I studied this tensor analysis, it was like extra assumption, which comes from nowhere. Generally, you can write all the formulas without doing that. Well, um, you could uh, you could uh, say that. Um your metric is not uh, covariantly uh, constant. But uh, as far as I remember, um, that would, uh, if you write the action using the affine connection, then it would result in your metric uh, anyways being uh, covariant constant. I may be wrong right here. 
Well, but as far as I remember, mm -hmm. it is so. If you are, if you if your action, uh, uh, excuse me. Yeah, there are some cases when it is non-zero, but then you have to introduce this extra tensor, so third rank tensor, which so you basically should define somehow this uh, covariant derivative. Anyways, anyways, Timur, may I ask another question about maybe the final purpose? So now you overview this machinery, which is kind yes. of. Uh, known, uh, it is applied in general relativity, for instance. Yes. But then, what what you then what you aim to do, uh, just uh, uh, to better understand the motivation. Uh, we are aiming to do that using this machinery. You can compute the same quantity as Berry phase. Mm, yes, I, I believe yes. But then, uh, in fact, what you need is to explain the resonances of the Mebius ring, speaking roughly speaking, yes. So the, the final, the final goal. Uh, it is not the final goal of this presentation. Uh, this presentation is a rather educational one and a resultful one. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm going to discuss mostly the machinery rather than uh, results themselves. Uh, our goal uh, in the research, however, is to explain the shift. That okay. is, mm -hmm. we'll discuss this at the end. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> so uh, now we may proceed to the concept of the holonomy. Uh, so imagine that you have defined uh, a closed path uh, in the uh, base manifold. Uh, now, using the transition mapping, you may move along the fibers. Uh, uh, in the fibers along this path uh, in base manifold. <clears throat> Due to the non-triviality of the transition, uh, when you go through the full loop in the base, uh, in the fibers, you may now get uh, not get to the same point at which you started. Uh, and so, uh, the mapping between the initial point and uh, the ending point in the fibers is called the holonomy. <clears throat> um, so, and uh, this holonomy is given uh, by this expression, formula five, uh, where P is, uh, is a path ordering operator. So, uh, now that we have this conception, uh, I may explain the metric approach that is found in uh, literature considering the Mebel strip. Uh, what they do first, they set a metric. Uh, for example, a metric of a Mebel strip. Uh, with uh, sigma twist, which means that uh, the number of twists is sigma. Uh, the metric is nice and good because it's diagonal. Uh, however, uh, it turns out to be nonlinear uh, in coordinates because u and v here are our coordinates. Uh, then you have to compute the connection. So basically, this formula six gives you the distance between the two points at the Mebius strip. Yes, yes, yes parameterized in terms of u and v. Okay. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, then, using uh, this metric, you may compute the connection. Uh, and uh, using the connection, you may uh, define the covariant derivative. Sorry, I have a question. Uh, yes. Uh, since we have only two coordinates, do I get it right that the Mebel strip is like infinitely thin, or so mm. does it have a, does it have any finite thickness? Uh, no, using this metric, uh, it would be uh, inadequate to uh, uh, trying to uh, describe the finite thickness uh, Mebel strip. Okay, so yeah, so okay, it's like infinitely thin. Yes. Uh, so uh, using the connection, you may uh, now define the covariant derivative. And uh, to 
uh, describe your field in the uh, in your object. Uh, only thing you need to do is to uh, uh, rewrite uh, the action or the Hamiltonian using the covariant derivatives. Uh, but uh, remember that you also have uh, the uh, boundary conditions uh, that uh, should be also included in the action. And uh, they would be the main problem here because uh, they are still, uh, either you take them in the, um, param uh, in the parametric space of UV of the Mobius strip or either you take them uh, in the real space, uh, anyway, they would be quite ugly. <clears throat> Uh, so, uh, after you've done all of that and you uh, computed all of your fields, you solved the uh, field equations and so on and so forth, you may uh, compute the holonomy, uh, which, is, uh, which is given by the formula that we discussed above. And uh, this is the same quantity as the Berry's phase. Uh, but uh, up to now, it is not obvious why. Uh, from my explanation, it is not obvious. Uh, in literature, of course, you can find it, uh, though not in these terms. Uh, to explain this, uh, we need to view the Berry theory from the bundle point of view. So uh, we need to first define what is a principal bundle. Uh, roughly speaking, a principal bind, uh, bundle is a fiber bundle in which uh, all of the fibers are representations, not exactly linear representations, uh, but uh, in general, uh, in general sense, uh, representations of some group G. And then uh, this uh, fiber bundle is called principal G bundle. Uh, an example of uh, such uh, fiber bundle is the construction of a wave function of the charged particle. Uh, then uh, space time is considered as the base manifold uh, and a set of all wave functions with the same modulus, uh, but with a different phase, which is a representation of electrodynamic U1 group. Uh, is considered as a typical fiber or the fiber. Mm, in the figure, space and time are represented by a straight line for simplicity. Uh, since the phase changes cyclically from zero to two pi, uh, we represent the fiber as a circle. The section corresponds to the choice uh, of the phase at each point of uh, space and time, that is uh, the specification of a wave function. Uh, the connection with such a construction will be electromagnetic for potential. I didn't write here the derivation, but uh, <laughs> you may believe me. Uh, if we count the transition maps, it turns out that this will be well-known expressions for the phase difference between two points uh, of uh, charged particle in uh, electromagnetic field, which is this. Uh, you may compare it with uh, the uh, expression for the holonomy and you will see that it is the same. So uh, in essence, Berry theory differs from the previous example only uh, in the basic manifold M. For example, let R be a set of parameters. Uh, let's fix the total energy, which corresponds to the assumption of adiabaticity in uh, the classical derivation of Berry phase. Then the full Hamiltonian uh, expressed in terms of parameters uh, gives you the equation in, param in parametric space. This equation defines uh, a certain manifold M uh, in the parameter space, you consider it as a base. The fibers are the same as in the previous example. Uh, uh, this 
uh, these fibers, which are uh, uh, wave function modular, it's modulus. Uh, so uh, the connection uh, in this case would be a Berry connection. Uh, if you take a look at uh, the classical formula for a Berry connection, which is the formula 12, uh you and if you recall that the connection is a generator of the shifts as we discussed earlier um the derivative as it is, should be is nothing more than the operator expression of the shifts generator and now you may in the same manner compute the holonomy of uh, such fiber bundle and it turns out to be a very phase uh, which is formula uh, 13. So, uh, uh, what can be said about the relationship between the holonomy, uh, between the two holonomies, the uh, Berry holonomy and uh, the metric holonomy? In a way, in relation to our problem, metric holonomy provides you with more information. Uh, since it tells you uh, how an arbitrary uh, field, not necessarily even transverse, changes in uh, general when trans uh, uh, traversing a closed contour due to the geometry of the manifold. Whereas a berry phase, uh, optical berry phase, traditionally calculated using Jones vectors, acts only in the part of the tangent space perpendicular to the wave vector in which we then also factor everything in modulus. Uh, if we denote the projection of the tangent space, uh, space onto a Berry phase as G, we can construct formulas connecting uh, Berry phase and the holonomy of the metric. So how do we construct them? Uh, we may construct them using the diagrams, commutative diagrams. Uh, so if uh, G is invertible, uh, this is the diagram you should use. Uh, t, uh, t x, x m is uh, the tangent space in point x. Uh, t uh, x plus x uh, prime m is uh, the tangent space in uh, point x plus x prime. Uh, and the same goes for the very fibers here. So using uh, our projection, we if it's invertible, uh, we may now uh, compute sequentially uh, first uh, transfer from uh, the tangent space to the Berry fiber. Then we go uh, the some some path in the Berry fibers, and then we go back to the tangent space. That would be a formula for the uh, uh, holonomy in the uh, in the tangent space. However, if we do the inverse, we would result in this formula. So uh, J here is the Jones projection where you, what you do basically when you uh, define an optical wave function. Uh, however, is uh, J is not invertible. Uh, it, is, it isn't possible to write uh, the exact uh, connection between them, it is given by this formula. So there is no direct morphism between uh, the Berry phase and the uh, uh, holonomy in, uh, on your manifold. So you have to some, somehow find a way to fix it. For example, uh, you may know the direction of a wave uh, vector in every uh, point of your manifold, so that you may now proceed back from your Jones projection to the uh, full tangent space. So um, that is basically everything I wanted to say uh, about the holonomies and the methods that we can approach the problem of uh, Mebius strip. Uh, we are going to do the further research. Uh, Nikolai is going to uh, 
as far as I know, is going to tell you more about the numerical research uh, of the Mebel strip and the ring. I think in one month. Yes. <laughs> My colleagues are telling me in one month. In one month. Uh, and um, well, uh, they already, uh, Nikolai and uh, Mikhail Sidenka already have conducted the experiment uh, for the ring. Um, here you can see uh, a spectra that they uh, have uh, computed and uh, the spectra that they uh, took from the experiment. Uh, you can see practically the perfect coincidence. Yes, uh, so uh, we're going to research this topic even more and uh, uh, that's basically it. Uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, I would love to answer your questions. Thanks, Timur. Uh, now the talk is open for questions. Please, colleagues. I yeah. have a question. Please, Vanya. So, so, uh, can, so if we forget about the wave nature of light, can we uh, uh, use some geometrical optics approach and calculate uh, the using the Fermat principle the uh, what is called kind of acoustics uh, of, of, of rays of light uh, on the Möbius strips with different bundles wouldn't would we get something very similar uh, to, to, to to what is observed in terms of shift of the frequency and so on. So. Uh, well, uh, if you have some sort of a bundle, so you have to have uh, fibers. Mm -hmm. If you don't have fibers, you you would you would you would not have such uh, such um, such an effect. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you just uh, take a curve in the manifold, it it doesn't give you any halogeny. Okay, I see. I have another question. So the electric field, uh, like in real dielectric structure, electric field doesn't live only uh, inside the inside the Möbius strip. So probably it's a silly question, but but it lives both in the three dimensional space and the dielectric structure. And uh, uh, as far as I understand, in in, in thin in thin structures, it can mostly live outside the dielectric. Uh, structure. So, how is that? Is it in some way incorporated in the analysis? Or no, we we um, discuss the field that is uh, bound within the within mm -hmm. the structure. So, mm -hmm. if you are going to consider the field that is uh, not in the structure, you have to go back to the coordinates of the space in which your structure embedded. And re-parameterize the uh, coordinates on the on your surface. But but this is the, just the same field actually. It's like it's not like you have two different uh, entities field outside the field inside. So yes, yes. Uh, you take the solutions of what you have uh, calculated using mm -hmm. uh, the uh, this geometry, and uh, you just simply you remember we had. Um, we had uh, coordinates on the Möbius strip U and V. They mm -hmm. have the expressions using the three-dimensional coordinates. And what mm -hmm. you do is you uh, now reparameterize the solutions with uh, real coordinates. Mm -hmm. But isn't it so? I'm, I'm still probably I'm oversimplifying. So uh, can you just take the some something very similar quasi classical like uh, born zomerfeld or how it's called quantization uh, in u and v then reparameterize everything in the real coordinates to get something very similar to what to what you have so or, or probably i'm just over uh, simplifying um uh, you mean why do you need uh... The... So, so suppose that you 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 just you just uh, impose the the condition that in the in the coordinates u and v your uh, your field should be like periodic, right? In space and time, this gives you frequencies of uh, of your uh, 
system. Then you reparameterize everything in, in the original coordinates and probably you, uh, you somehow get the dependence of the frequency on the number of bundles. So, no, okay, sorry. Probably I, I just didn't, didn't get the machinery. I, I'm just I, I I'm trying to understand is it really possible is isn't really is it really required to uh, to take all this machinery with the uh, bundles and fibers uh, to get some qualitative result on the uh, on the shift of the uh, frequency with a with a number of twists but well it's just uh, well. Uh you may just solve the equations mm -hmm. right uh, and there would be uh, you would have the spectra and so on and so forth but uh, it's like uh, the numerical calculation it mm -hmm. is it has the same problem you know mm -hmm. that the spectra is like this but you don't know why it is so mm -hmm. So uh, to understand why the spectra is like this, mm -hmm. uh, you would like to know what leads to the shift. Why, uh, why the spectra senses the additional twists if it's parameterized only in the inner coordinates? Okay, I have, I have a more like a silly, like straightforward question. So suppose that we are studying not uh, not the electromagnetic waves, but we are studying sound waves. So the scalar, the scalar field. So there, there will be no, uh, no like special uh, features connected with uh, with this member strip if we consider the the propagation of the scalar fields along the uh, uh, along the member strip. So do we need the vector nature of the field here? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I'm not sure that uh, you will get uh, the holonomy uh, mm -hmm. non-zero, non mm -hmm. but uh, you will certainly have to, uh, well, uh, it is a scalar, so uh, it doesn't feel any geometry practically at all, uh, mm -hmm. but um, you may still uh, construct all of this uh, fiber bundle construction. Mm -hmm. So my uh, my answer is uh, you would get no uh, geometrical phase here, but mm -hmm. uh, you may construct the same uh, construction to uh, evaluate it uh, quantitatively. Not yeah, and the, the the interesting question is: Will you have the shift uh, uh, of the frequencies with a number of twists or no? I think uh, I'm too afraid to uh, to make a mistake here, but uh, mm. my guess is no. Okay. Okay. Well, let, let me ask one more question, maybe related to the previous one. So, Timur, do you know some papers on uh, Schrodinger equation on a Mobius strip? Yes. So you just yeah you just solve for the eigen energies of the particle. Yes. Uh, really placed really in such. One. Yeah. So, do they have uh, the shift of these energies with the number of twists? They didn't compute, uh, as far as I remember, they didn't compute uh, the energy spectra for the. Um, for more than one twist. Yeah, but then if, if you calculate that, if you continue the logic, would you obtain a shift? So that's my question. You should obtain such shift. Uh huh. Okay. That's the problem so. may arise in uh, computing it. Yeah, of course, but this is uh, technical more or less. So this answers Vanya's question. Uh, so it's enough to use scalar model, just standard Schrodinger equation, and solving with this metric. Okay, good. And then uh, maybe a nasty question. I have to ask nasty questions because then you will be writing a paper and reviewers will definitely ask you that. So why do you think that the shift of resonances which you observe in experiment is in any way related to Berry phase? Why do you think this is not some non-trivial effect? So assume this is a question from the review of your paper. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. 
Okay, you can, you can show. Okay, so I knew that uh, such question would come. Me, me, but you, 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 we, we knew, yes, yes. We knew that such question would come. You see, uh, if you compare uh, the three, uh, like the first two galleries uh, of the ring uh, and of the Mobile Strip, uh, you will see that uh, one gallery shifts while the other stands. This is unpublished. <laughs> yes, <laughs> this is still unpublished work, but so uh, one gallery feels that the uh, that the structure has the additional twists, while the other doesn't feel that. And uh, the same situation goes with uh, the additional twists all along so that's interesting and so what's your interpretation mm, why this happens next talk. yes uh probably nikolai will have to tell you uh, this next talk uh, have some ideas. we have some idea it is connected to the berry face uh but uh, i'm not sure that i'm ready to fully explain it I'm yeah, because, too... because in the very beginning of your talk, I had maybe a naive interpretation of the shift of resonances which you showed. So you basically, uh, you showed that the more twists you have, the higher the resonance goes in frequency. So my very naive interpretation was the following. By including more twists, you are making like a ring with the average permittivity, which is lower than that of the material of the Mendel strip, because you have a system, some air plus dielectric. So the permittivity goes down and hence effectively you're like solving the problem of resonances of a ring with some average permittivity and then you get this uh, blue shift of resonances. But uh -huh. what you are saying now that some of the resonances do shift while others don't. So this might, at least this might uh, be the argument against such simplified interpretation. Yes. Uh, and also, your field uh, in um, Mobius strip uh, leaves. Uh, if your uh, permittivity is high enough, the field leaves only in the in the bulk of the Mobius strip. So why would no, I? It's 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 a question because uh, if you look uh, at, at simulations by Nikolai, for instance, then you will see that in any case the field goes outside, so the modes are radiative. Yes, but the higher the permittivity, as far as I understand, the, the less field lives outside. Yeah, that, that's true, but still you are bound to take some realistic values, unfortunately. Oh, yes, yes, it's true. But uh, uh, my belief is that, uh, our belief is that uh, uh, these properties uh, of the Mabel strip should be uh, related to the topology and geometry of a member strip rather than the, um, uh, the growth of effective length or something like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But this has to be clearly proved because this will be the point number one when the reviewers will be considering Indeed. considering the paper. Yes. Good. Thanks. Some, any other questions, colleagues? Uh, I do not see raised hands. Just so, comment. I, I would just comment that uh, that uh, well, you, you mentioned the Schrodinger equation. So Schrodinger equation is slightly different uh, thing because there you have a phase, which uh, which is something uh, which can also be treated like non-trivially and be affected by geometry. I, I was uh, talking about like a scalar field, uh, uh, scalar real field, like ah oh, okay, and like then. Because if you see something in there, then you have problems. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. Because in Schrodinger equation, you should get this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. Because you have a very phase in Schrodinger But equation. I, I, I understood your question and answered according to the real uh, scholar. Uh, yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah, good, thanks. So we'll be waiting for the second chapter of this uh, exciting work. Not uh, thanks. You, you don't finish by second. Good, good. Thank you, Mikhail. We'll be waiting for further chapters of this exciting story. Uh, so thank you, Timur. 
stay with us. Yeah. So next time we'll basically have a break uh, due to the, some changes. But then on the 24th, so in two weeks, we will have a talk uh, now broadcasted from France. Uh, so Laboratory of Theoretical Physics and Statistical Models uh, in Paris, Mikhail Zvonarev. <laughs>